Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are y'all doing tonight? Hopefully, y'all are doing well, and hopefully, things are going good. Oh, man, oh, man. Let's see here. What I'm trying to do is uh, get some camera things set up. Bear with me a second here. Almost got her. How are y'all doing? Give me just a second here. Lord have mercy. Lord. All right. So hopefully y'all are doing well tonight. Uh, the audio might be a little weird. I don't know if you guys are seeing my lips move at the same time. But uh, it looks like my voice is coming out or sounds like my voice is coming out before my lips move. So if I say one, two, three, let me know if that's uh, if my lips are <laughs> if the sounds coming out by the time I uh, come in. So uh, sorry about last night. Um, I had a lot of modifications I needed to do to the CNC. Uh, to get everything ready and then with uh, uh, working with customers and everything I could not get uh, last night going um, or I could not get everything done in time uh, to have the uh, the the class last night um, the carving all together was about seven hours from start to finish and I had a one of those fast forward videos so we could see some of the different stages and all uh, but it's still got about 45 minutes of rendering. It's been rendering for the last three hours, unfortunately, and it didn't get done. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to um, play a little bit of video uh, in the um, in here. I, it's not really going to be a um, fast forward video but we'll we'll kind of make it a fast forward video if that makes sense and uh if you give me a second we're going to get the ball a rolling and um let's see if it uh Okay. All right. So, uh, welcome, uh, Stephen Camaro. Uh, welcome, Troy, Sylvia, Robert, uh, Keith. How you doing, Keith? Uh, Jimmy, Ronnie, and uh, Dave Gatton. Welcome. Thanks, Dave. I'm getting a little late start today, as you can see. Not quite flustered yet, but a little bit. Paul Handwork and um, uh, Stephen Main. How you doing, bud? How's everything going? Um. So we've got 23 people with us tonight. Uh, it's Friday night. Everybody's out doing the Corona party or whatever. So I can understand uh, it's going to be a low, uh, low uh, class uh, last night. Um, but let's get uh, things uh, going here. Let's see if I can talk our way through some stuff. See if I can get my screen share up in here, up a happening in here. All right, cool. All right, so if you recall on Tuesday, hey, Tippy Luter, how you doing? Uh, I meant there's a few of you I didn't get a chance to mention, but how are y'all doing? Hey, Crystal, how are you doing? Um, so on Tuesday night, we talked about fourth axis. Uh, in, in far as the, as far as the design aspect goes, uh, and uh, the final result of the design that we made was this 
weave basket. So let me wrap this bad boy up here and um, let's see if I can uh, come in here. And so this was the uh, project. Uh, the, this is what we were wanting for the end result uh, was a bit of this basket. And like I said, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do. Maybe cut the lid off or make a, make that top part, the lid and everything. And, um, uh, and all, but what I ended up doing was I had to make some changes on my CNC, uh, on the fourth axis. And we're going to go over to the CNC here in a minute and talk about it. Um, I ended up creating a bit of a sensor for easy touch off for each of my tools, uh, for the tool changes and everything. Uh, normally, uh, the touch off, uh, normally we would, um, touch off to like the tail stock. And that tailstock is a one inch diameter. So when we're touching off to the tailstock, we're a half inch from center, right? And that's where we zero out from. And it was easy and all, but this piece was larger in diameter. If you recall, it was around six inches by six inches. Uh, and so therefore my CNC even with a bit in there could not get to the tailstock properly, especially on the shorter bits and all. Uh, couldn't quite get to it for... Um, uh, touch off. So I thought, you know what? I've been wanting to do this for a long time anyway. So uh, I made some modifications to my CNC and uh, took basically like, you know, we have a touch plate, we have a quick set block. Well, I made a little touch button, basically not button, but a touch uh, for my fourth axis. And uh, I'm going to walk you through kind of what I did and, and everything so you can kind of see what's happening uh, and everything. Um, but uh, before we do that, let me take you through uh, kind of the stages in a photo type uh, scenario. Uh, so let me uh, pull this out so I can be full screen here. And I'm going to switch cameras for a minute uh, so that we can get a full screen of uh, the images that I'm pulling up here. And so the first image and uh, all uh, hopefully y'all can still hear me. Uh, <laughs> the first image is um, the blank that we started out with. So it was uh, six inches by six inches. Technically, it was six and an eighth by six and an eighth. I didn't cut it down to six by six. Uh, by four and three quarter inches uh, in its width, uh, you know. And I took it over to the... CNC, and I ended up uh, rounding it down to five and seven eighths. That's my that was the round that I could get out of that six by six. Uh, so um, the in the rounding, if we come in here, uh, this is that blank uh, after the rounding procedure. And the um, rounding procedure, uh, it took, I don't know, uh, 45 minutes or so uh, to get it nice and round. Uh, whatever this material is, whatever this wood is, I really don't know. I'd have to ask um, the gentleman who sent it to me. But, man, whatever it is, it carved beautifully. It was really nice. Uh, uh, man, when it round and trued up, it was slick as all be it. Uh, then there was a rough cut, which I don't, I didn't grab a picture of the rough cut. But I do want to show kind of part of the uh, finish cut uh, and everything. So you can see half rough, half finish here. Uh, and so this was uh, kind of the halfway stage. Now, there's still more finish to go. We're going to actually see it carving uh, the remaining part of this finish. I think it's going to take a little while. But I was hoping to have a small little 15-minute fast-forward video through the process. Uh, but like I said, it's still rendering. So what I do have is uh, I've got a video um, of the process and you'll see on the CNC and we're going to actually go over to the CNC in a minute, but you'll see that little button that the router's in front of over there. And uh, what that uh, did was it gave uh, my bit uh, a, an ability to touch off. And that sensor is a certain distance away from the center of my stock. And the way I have it mounted, uh, it'll remain that distance. So every, no matter if I'm using short stock, long stock, and I'm moving that tail stock down the 
the fourth axis, uh, that button is fixed to the uh, tail stock. So the distance will remain uh, constant. And, you know, I don't uh, really have a way of fast forwarding. Um, let me see here. Let me see if I have a way of fast forwarding. Do I have a way of fast forwarding in this? No. Not that I'm aware of. Unfortunately, I don't. So it's kind of a slow process, and I would love to it be the fast forward video that I made that showed the process in its entirety. But uh, right now we're at the uh, roughing stage. I've got a quarter inch end mill in the bit. And the uh, computer blanked out right, or the camera blanked out right at that second. Uh, I think I tripped on the wire when I was uh, getting ready to hit start. But um, the uh, this is me creeping the router in just to check my distances and things, making sure that that bit when it starts isn't going to plunge in or do something weird. Uh, and um, and then. From there, um, I was able to uh, hit the start button and uh, get it to start. Now, you're going to see me creeping in a little bit more. Again, I'm, now I'm beside the stock, going in beside it to see, uh, you know, just make sure my distance, how much my bit is taking per pass and everything, make sure I'm not, you know, taking too much and all. It's just me kind of doing some little checks and balances and all. And um, when I'm happy with it, I go ahead and back it out. And then I'm about ready to hit start. Um, and so on the, uh, once it starts, we've got the chips of flying and everything. We've got sawdust all over the place from the roughing cut. I didn't go ahead and clean anything off. But uh, now we're in operation and the bit is going to start making its cut. Now, I can't hear the audio. Tell me if the audio of this video is playing and it's if it's too loud or anything. I think I had the microphone muted, so you should not hear any audio but me speaking right now. Um, in all. So uh, let me know if that is true to fact. All right, good. Um, because... Uh, I don't want any audio issues or anything like that uh, at all. Now, the roughing stage uh, was, uh, to rough it out, it was about an hour and 30 minutes uh, to rough the piece out. And, um, man, I wish this was fast forwarding. I wish I had a way to control that in, uh, in, in, um, let me see here. Do I have a way to fast forward? Captions, virtual cam, profile view, edit, transform, fit to screen, blah, blah, blah. So, no, unfortunately, I don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out of this camera and I'm going to do a screen share so I have control over the video. Uh, and um, that way we can kind of fast forward through the stages. Then we're going to get at the CNC and we're going to watch the rest of this car. And again, if any of you have any questions while we're talking and stuff, now's the good time to talk. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to switch back over to me for a moment. And um, how y'all doing? Uh, that way I can uh, control the video myself. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop that. And let's open up the video on its own. Hope y'all are doing well tonight. <clears throat> All right, and uh, that screen is uh, coming up, coming up, coming up. Uh, 
All right. So let's split the view. Get it uh, kind of. Uh, let's add that stream in there. And so this is uh, back at the beginning. Let's kind of uh, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, so during its roughing stage, now this is the first pass. So now it's kind of cleaning up and uh, doing the edge profile. So after each pass, uh, it comes and does an outer edge profile of that pass. So that's what it's doing. It's kind of doing that um, and, uh, and, and all. So, uh, Ronnie, great question. Uh, Ronnie's uh, question is, is Laney, does the button come with the fourth axis? No, it does not. It's a DIY. Uh, I spent about a hundred bucks uh, at Lowe's and bought a whole bunch of crap and only ended up using about 15 bucks worth of the stuff. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm going to show you that when we get to the CNC and everything uh, and, and all. So, uh, I DIY'd it uh, and all. Uh, basically to do a little bit of cable management. Uh, I bought some stuff for some cable management and because I have coming out of the control board, we have inputs, uh, our touch plate sensors and input, the touch blocks and input. And now this fourth axis button is an input uh, and everything is reading off of input two on the board, if you will. And the uh, on the input, um, my when I rewired for the button, I decided to rewire for the touch plate and the quick set tool. And so I'll show you exactly what I did. I actually don't have the touch plate and the quick set tool uh, wired up right now, but you'll be able to see what I'm doing and what I'm going to do with those uh, so that everything is uh, all the inputs are separate. They're not tied together. Uh, let me, sh let me see if I can maximize me a bit. And uh, let me grab some cableage here. So, you know, on earlier on, you know, for the touch plate wire, which was, you know, our, our little, uh, where are we at here? Our little touch plate. This is our little Z touch plate that goes down for Z touch off and everything. Well, at this point here, I had a connector and it split off to, for me, it split off to the quick set zeroing block. Uh, this guy right here. You know, and I don't have him hooked up right now. I don't have the touch plate hooked up. I'm holding it in my hand. Uh, so uh, that split, that, that that little splitter where I have some electrical tape. Sorry, I'm over here. Uh, it ran off to this. And uh, I never liked that. Uh, it wasn't clean enough for me. And I never really did anything with it. But this gave me the opportunity to get her done uh, and everything. And so uh, I ended up taking this out of the control box, uh, putting in another wire. And uh, while I was at Lowe's, I picked up one of these little uh, connector hubs. And so from the control box, I have uh, my ground coming in to uh, this bottom, the bottom terminal on the CNC. And then coming out, I have it going to the gator clip that clips to the table to send the ground through the table. And then the sensor, which is going to be the uh, touch plate uh, and everything, uh, I'll have uh, the touch plate and the fourth axis coming out of here, or out of the bottom, actually. Touch plate and fourth axis out of these two terminals, which you'll see. And then these three are daisy chained together. To, so from my control box, it comes in, and then it loops over to each of these, uh, activating all three of these, which are going to be the touch plate. And I've got it wired up with, with, this is just what I had left over. This was the extra piece. You can cut them down to size, whatever you need. Uh, and, uh, yes, I'm going to show how you find your center, uh, and all of that stuff, Robert. Uh, we're going to do that when we get at the CNC. And so, uh, the, um, I ended up rewiring that and creating that button, which you'll see in a moment. Now, if we maximize this back up a little bit, uh, as it went through the roughing stage, let's see if we can get a little further along, uh, in the roughing stage. It uh, started to take shape, you know, all of those little levels that you see there. And let's uh, let's maximize it up full screen here. Uh, all the different levels that you see uh, here, that's uh, where the braids are going to be cut in with the finish cut gets cut in and stuff. And um, once it was done uh, cutting to all the its final depth and all, 
Uh, we'll move forward a little bit uh, more. Uh, let me uh, get it right to, let me back up a little bit. Back up. So as it was cutting its final uh, passes here, which we'll kind of uh, watch as it kind of cuts its final passes on the roughing stage. Oops. Sorry about that. Air compressor kicked in. Uh, as it was as it was cutting, it was doing its once it does its final pass, it is now doing the profile cut. So it's kind of cleaning up those edges uh, from that raster cut back and forth, back and forth with the grain. And so uh, how long a piece can the fourth axis do? Uh, uh, John says um, the fourth axis uh, can carve. Uh, up to 37 inches in length, eight inches in diameter, eight inches in diameter. And this piece was six inches. Uh, so great question. Uh, and Robert, uh, are you going to show how you find your center and set up your touch off for all the different axes? Yes. I'm going to talk about the whole process of uh, how you switch into fourth axis mode and everything when we get to the CNC here in just a moment. Yes, sir. Now, once the um, once the final roughing was done of this part, uh, then uh, there came a tool change. Uh, and um, here's a little backup view so you can see all the sawdust. Uh, I did not have the dust shroud on so that I could uh, film everything. So it sure did make some sawdust uh, and uh, loved it, every bit of it. Um, now, during the uh, process, whoops, I went a little far over there. Uh, during the process, uh, the bit was, oh, back up there, put in. Uh, you'll see my arm reaching in and everything. Um, and so, uh, Joa, uh, the 5100 is uh, basically this fourth axis mounts to the table of the 5100. Uh, and you would carve it. Now, if you want your own custom links, uh, then you would DIY a fourth axis, which is basically a motor chuck and a tail stock that you can extend out across your whole table, Joe. Uh, and um, the, uh, um, the, but uh, if someone bought the fourth axis for the 5100, it would be this fourth axis um, and you would mount it onto the table. So it would have the same capacity, but uh, it would actually, it's, uh, it's 58 inches long. So you could actually go longer since you're setting it on the 5100. Uh, you could actually go out past 37 inches. You could go that whole uh, part is about 48 inches in length. So you could probably get a good 40 to 42 to uh, 40 to 42 inches out of it, uh, maybe 46, but you could uh, extend it out, you know, even farther. It's not hard to do a DIY scenario with that uh, and everything. Um, and um, so during the tool change, let's see if I can uh, get in here. Uh, there was a uh, some downtime between phone calls and everything. That's why I fast forwarded it. Uh, I, and it's not fast forwarded in this, this is, but, um, the, let's see if I can get the, uh, touch off procedure in here. See if I can back it up just a little bit. All right, so basically uh, the unit moves down to that uh, button and then uh, it comes in and uh, touches off. Once it makes contact, it stops. Uh, manually program in the uh, distance. I can set up a code if I wanted to, to where it will automatically set that up. But uh, right now I just got everything wired last night. So it's manual. Uh, once that touch off is uh, programmed in, then uh, it is backed off. And 
and ready to run. So right now I'm sitting at the computer uh, loading the file. Uh, about this time, the phone rang. Uh, and uh, let's uh, back it up just a little bit. And I think it's right about here where we're ready to run, where I hit start. And so now this is the uh, uh, eighth inch tapered ball nose bit. Uh, there is no pass depth with, with the ball nose bit. It cuts down to its final depth. So it plunges into the final depth of the model and uh, it does its final cut. Um, the roughing is meant, the rough cut is meant to hog away the waste material uh, in everything. Uh, and this is me turning the RPMs down on the router. Uh, you'll see my hand on the back of the router. I'm turning the RPMs down. Uh, I wanted a little bit uh, bigger chip size coming off of that little four flute bit. Uh, so I'm adjusting the RPMs as it's carving uh, and um, just watching how uh, the chips are coming off because it's only stepping over 8% of the diameter of that eighth inch bit. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, going there. Now, uh, Ronnie says, Lainey, could you use a half inch end mill to cut the piece faster? Yeah, you can use any size end mill you want. For my rounding tool path, I used a three eighths inch end mill. Uh, for the roughing, I did a quarter of an inch. The reason why I did a quarter of an inch is because I can remove more material closer to the 3D finish cut with my quarter inch end mill than I can with my half inch end mill. My half inch end mill can only remove so much material because of its diameter um, that uh, I decided to use a smaller end mill to really rough away as much as I possibly could. But yes, you can use any size bit that you want for any stage of this. Uh, now, when it comes to the finish stage, uh, I used an eighth inch ball nose bit and uh, the eighth inch ball nose uh, gave me a much uh, a very good uh, finished piece, a very good finished piece. Um, but the, uh, you know, if I would have wanted to double the run time to 10 hour run time, uh, I could have used the 16th inch tapered ball nose and gotten really fine detail and all. But uh, you'll see here as we get uh, up at the machine and we start talking about the machine a little bit and, and, and setting it up and stuff uh, that uh, the uh, eighth inch ball nose did a good enough job. And so, and I had, I was on a time restraint to be able to get as far as I got, uh, so that we could, uh, move along. Uh, and, um, uh, do, does it have to be centered or can it touch, uh, can it touch it anywhere on that button? It does not have to be centered on the button. Uh, and it, when I call it a button, it's not like a push button. It's a sensor. It's a brass cap basically. And brass isn't that conductive, but it does conduct very well for this low voltage and everything. Uh, but uh, you're going to see the setup. We're going to, uh, I'm going to move back and bring the camera up and we'll see that in just a second. But no, it can touch anywhere on that flat uh, face of that button uh, and uh, the distance is the same. Uh, for me, from the tip of that button, when my bit touches, um, that looks a little provocative. Hold on a second. When my bit touches the button, um, from that point to the center of my stock, uh, it's exactly 2.746 uh, inches away. And so that's what gets programmed in uh, to the Z. So when it's when it comes and touches that button, it gets programmed in 2.746. And then uh, we, uh, you know, um, go from there. But anywhere on the face. And let's go back up to, I missed a couple of questions. Um when a spire wraps the design around the, around the cylinder, will there be a seam at zero at the ends? And that's a great question. So let's uh, minimize the video for a moment and bring the aspire back up for a second and let me get uh, full screen here. Uh, great question, uh, come here. Um, if I turn this back on its side here, 
and rotate it. Let me see if I can get it rotated around uh, to where the seam is. Come on around. Come on around. I'm clicking the little button up here uh, to uh, get it to come around. It's almost there. I did a good job with the seam. Hold on a second. There it is. All right. Let me zoom into this. Okay. Let it, uh, oh, sorry. Hold on a second. Let me get her up to uh, par here. All right. So the seam is right here along this. And how you can tell where the seam is, and now if I would have did a little bit of uh, finessing with the model, I could have got it where it looked perfect. But notice each of these strands are three beads, right? Each of these strands are three beads. But at the seam, it's two beads. See there? Uh, so uh, the seam is uh, got two beads. And if I would have uh, if I would have uh, wanted to, I could have extended the model out a little bit so that when it did meet up, it would have been the three seams. But I didn't pay that much attention to the detail when I was uh, designing it and all. But let's talk about the actual design itself and the toolpath for this. So the first thing is let's get into the design here. Uh, and um, let's zoom out just a little bit. So... <clears throat> If you notice my black lines here, uh, here, at the end of that black line, right here, that's the end of my stock. Okay, and let's see if I can fade out the model so you can see my lines here. That's the end of my stock right there at both ends. And my model passes by the end of the stock. Now, if I would have um, if I would have extended it out a little bit further, I could have got my third bead. And if I would have uh, done the modeling a little bit different, I could have had two beads on this side, one bead on the other side. So that way, when it did come together, it created that three beads. But I have it, um, you know, extended slightly past so that when it wraps around, it really tightens up that seam. And in the tool path itself which you cannot see in this low resolution screen here but uh i'm using the material as the boundary for the machining limit boundary and i have a boundary offset of an eighth of an inch so it overcuts by an eighth of an inch uh and that way it uh, really blends that seam in uh, very well. So if we go back to that 3D view uh, here, uh, the seam is uh, pristine. However, I am missing a bead. So notice the spacing between these two parts here, my squares, like my square spacing. Notice how narrow the square spacing is here. Um, and everything where that third, if I had my third bead in there and I had my equal distance spacing, uh, then, you know, it would have wrapped around very well and I uh, wouldn't be able to tell, but you know, on this back side, that is not going to be very noticeable. Someone with OCD in a very bad way would catch that and it would drive them crazy. But all you got to do is just, uh, you know, when you extend that model out, look at both ends and know that there's a band coming up and half of that band really needs to be on one side of the board, one end of the stock when it's unwrapped and the other half needs to be on the other end of the stock. So that way when it comes together, it makes that full band and, uh, and then do an overcut or an offset allowance to let it blend it in. And I didn't do the split on the band. If I would have stretched my stretch it, if I would have stretched my model out just a little bit more uh, and cut off uh, what I didn't need and get rid of it, then when I wrapped it up, it would have seamed up just perfectly. So great question on that. Uh, very good question. 
Uh, and uh, so the seam is uh, right now, the seam is invisible. And we're going to look at the seam when the part finishes carving. It's not finished yet. Uh, and all that. So let's see here. Um, let me see. I'm going to go back up because I did miss Stephen's question. And, and uh, uh, Crystal pointed it out to me. Thank you for that. Let's see here. Um, half inch end mill. We answered that question. Do you can touch off anywhere on the face plate? Um, and, uh, yeah. So yeah. And crystal, crystal, crystal says, uh, wow. I noticed it. Yeah. Camaro has OCD. So Camaro, uh, Steven, what you would, what you would do is when you're stretching that model out, uh, at the edges of your material, cause the model stretched over it. Uh, you want half of whatever your design is, you know, when it wraps together, you want that full piece or whatever it is, you know, so you want half on each end. So when it wraps around, it creates that full piece and blends right in. And when you do that overcut, um, uh, that allowance offset allowance, let the bit go past the finish line, if you will, uh, it will, uh, clean that up and everything. So, you know, yay for that. That's my new, I, I love that term. And I, I can't say that on video because that belongs to somebody on YouTube that I admire respectfully, but I love that uh, term. All right. Enough of me talking. We kind of saw a little bit of the, uh, the uh, preview and stuff and, uh, and all. And this is, uh, we'll take a quick peek at a look at the 3D cut. And again, you see, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, it's stepping over an eighth or 8% 8 of the diameter of that eighth inch bit, uh, you know, for a very nice finished cut. So now let's get on over to the, uh, the CNC and let's talk about the setup in general. And then we'll, uh, kind of finish off our carving and look at our end result. So let me switch over cameras and I'm going to switch my headset, uh, or switch over to my goofy looking headset, but let's get the camera switched over first. And um, there's the CNC. Almost looks like that video, right? Uh, so you can see there's still a little bit more to go. And I wanted to save that for you guys and girls. Uh, it's going to take probably about 20 minutes or so to carve that. So I do want to get it started as soon as possible. Uh, but let me switch over to my headset mic. Testing one, two, three. All right, so hopefully y'all can hear that. All right, before I move over to the uh, CNC, y'all thought the CNC started running, that was the video again. Fooled you. Um, I forgot to, uh, when I switched cameras, uh, I forgot to make it active. All right. There's the uh, garden still. Uh, we're ready for takeoff. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, hey, Evening, Ed, how are you doing? Uh, hey, Sylvia. All right. So, uh, we got a thumbs up and an ear. That means uh, we're good to go on the audio. Uh, and let's, uh, what I'm going to do now, you're going to see some camera movement now because I want to kind of back away and talk about the setup and how we get into fourth axis mode. And I want to talk about the buttons. So, excuse the uh uh the uh, not so steady cam um and all and let me take a quick second and <clears throat> throw a little layer on that for a minute all right let me get my microphone uh and all that where i can move over to the cnc where i'm not getting stuck now we are gonna we're not gonna be steady camming too much but uh, uh, I'm gonna do my best uh, to steady cam and let me pull this out the vacuum for a minute all right so the 2440 4th axis has a swivel plate that allows the router to pivot 90 degrees uh, and there are two bolts on the left side of the router and one over here that catches the hook. Uh, there's a 90 degree positive stop and a zero positive stop when it's flipped up uh, upright and everything. 
Uh, and what uh, you would do to convert to three ax or fourth axis mode is you would loosen these two bolts, nine sixteenths inch wrench. And uh, let's get in here on those two bolts right here, right there. This one and this one. It's on the left side of the router. And on this one here, to come from the side, and I'm trying to view the camera as I'm talking to you here. Um, on this one, uh, you will loosen the nut, and then you'll turn the head, because now there's another square nut right in the middle of the plate. It also acts as a spacer, but uh, you loosen this back nut here, and what that does is it allows this bolt to slide back and forth so that the it can release from the positive stop, the hook. Uh, so uh, you pivot it 90 degrees, you bring that hook all the way down to the bolt. It'll kind of pull that bolt back into position when it's all the way sitting rested where it's supposed to be. You tighten up this back head here and then you tighten up that nut there. And then you come over here and tighten up these nuts and that'll pull everything square. Now I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, back the router up so I can talk about the button. So I'm going to put us back on the steady cam for a second. Uh, let's get sit in there for a minute now in order to do this uh, properly I'm gonna have to modify the G code when I start back up because right now I'm in pause mode uh, and uh, in pause mode uh, let's see if I can switch screens just for a minute to show you my uh, my controller software here switch over to this just for a second uh, when you're in the planet CNC TNG uh, software in pause mode um, you're ready to crank the spindle back up hit pause and go right but if I stop this if I hit the stop button uh, I want to be able to pick up where I left off on the line of G code I left off at uh, now I'm gonna write down while I'm talking to you I'm gonna write down this line number so I know where to start back at and it's line number two hundred and ninety four thousand one hundred and sixty okay now in order for the spindle and everything to uh, 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 act properly on its speeds and feeds when we start in the middle of a G code uh, especially if you have a water cooled spindle we need the F codes, uh, the feed rate codes. So I'm going to scroll back up, and it's hard to see with the, you know, the screen resolution and everything. But at the beginning of the G code, there is our spindle speed uh, at the beginning there when you hit start. Uh, there's our feed rate and our plunge rate, the two F codes. Well, those do not appear throughout the entire finishing tool path until the very end. Uh, there, you know, uh, when, when things are shutting down and stuff. And if I start in the middle of a run uh, on, a, on a 3D model like this and other thing, now, and if I was doing a pocket cut, a profile cut, a V car cut, those feeds and speeds are all plunged throughout the, or, or you know, they're, 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 they're uh, populated, should I say, all throughout the G code. I mean, every few lines. But in a 3D model where I have a total of, let's go down to the very end here, uh, this G code was a total of 331,114 lines of G code. Um, does everybody else have sound? John Burton, uh, do you have sound? Does everybody have sound? I'm sitting here talking to myself that we do not have sound. Uh, so let's uh, let's do one more sound check. Uh, I had Sylvia and Ed and all, but John's asking. All right, so now somebody said it sounds like ladies in the background. So let me change. Does it sound like I'm like at a distance, or does because the microphone's right up to my face? Um, you guys tell me here. Uh, sounds like you're far away. Okay, let me change the microphone. Uh, bear with me a second here. Testing. Oh, 
I chose the wrong microphone, guys and girls. I'm so sorry about that. Um, that was my fault. That was my fault. How uh, is this better? <laughs> is this better? Testing one, two, three. Let me know if this is better. Okay. I chose I chose the wrong microphone. I chose the uh, webcam microphone. So we'll talk we'll go back and kind of recap what I said. But uh, so let's recap quickly in the TNG software what I said. Uh, you know, when I'm in pause mode, I can, you know, it's paused. It knows its feed speed. It knows its spindle speed and all that stuff. I don't have a water cooled spindle. I have a router, but if it was a spindle, so I could simply crank the spindle back up, hit unpause and go. But when I stop, uh, my F codes, my, uh, spindle speed and my S or my F, my feed and my plunge, they're at the beginning of this long 331,000 line code. Uh, and they don't appear anywhere through the middle of it. So what I've got to do is I got to modify the G code uh, that somewhere around the line that I stopped at, which is 294,160. Um, I've got to, I'm going to have to uh, insert manually the F speeds so that when it picks up and it, it reads those F speeds, it'll kind of level out to what, feed rate and plunge rate it's supposed to go otherwise it might get a little jumpy and like what in the hell is it doing um so you'll see me modify that g-code in a moment so what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop the program now that i've written down the line of g-code that i've stopped on uh and uh, that will allow me to control the c and c uh and um and everything so that I can uh, show you guys and girls what's going on. So we're going to switch back to the CNC camera. All right. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and back away. Bear with me a second. I am going to back away. Here in just a minute. <laughs> All right, let's uh Give me just a second. I got to get my um uh, I got to open up another program real quick. Give me just a second. Anti micro run as administrator. All right. So we had a little bit of a <clears throat> delay there. Okay, let me check everything, make sure it's all right. Stand by. My router has just decided to wait right there where it's at.
My CNC says, oh, no, I'm going to stay right here because this basket's looking good. And I do not want to screw it up. Uh, and um, it is uh, ultimately decided it does not want to move. All right. Now we're moving along. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I had, uh, my, um, uh, I had to open up my controller program. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Okay. So what I was saying, uh, earlier was that the pivot plate uh, on the fourth axe or to move to fourth axe mode, there's two bolts on the left side of the router, one over here. Uh, there's a positive stop, a positive hook here and one down there. You can see it at the lower of the table, 90 and zero. And um, you'll loosen these two bolts, nine sixteenths inch wrench. You'll loosen this nut and then you'll loosen that back head of that bolt and that will release, uh, it'll let the bolt uh, slide back forth so it releases. And then you want to be holding the router when you pivot it so uh, it just doesn't fall and turn 90 on you. Uh, but you want to lock it down on that bolt, tighten this up, tighten that, and then tighten these two and you're in fourth axis mode. Now, uh, to show you the button, let me pull this back a little further. And um, I'm going to travel the router down. Like I said, we don't have a steady cam going here. Okay. Now, I have uh, the older, a little bit older model, uh, fourth axis. And so it doesn't have the sliding tail stock like the new models do. Uh, the fourth axis was manufactured uh, to where there are four uh, bolts uh, and wing nuts underneath that uh, you would take them out and you can move down the length of the fourth axis, uh, depending on the length of your stock. And then you have your tail stock here that uh, you, when you tighten the back end, uh, it drives the tail stock into your piece. Well, this part here is a fixed position um, no matter where it's at down the table. And so what I have here is I have a simple piece of angle iron. Uh, and um, I have a uh, hole drilled in, a one inch diameter hole drilled into that angle iron. And through that angle iron, I have a basically a PVC kind of uh, plug, if you will, three quarter inch diameter plug. And then screwed to that diameter plug is a three quarter inch brass cap uh, to give me a nice uh, brass finish looking button there. Now coming over to the side here of that brass cap, I've got a drilled and tapped a uh, hole, a 440 hole, uh, and I have my wire uh, here running from my little uh, control area. Uh, control board uh, up through a hole in this plate and then secure to that. So that makes that active. So the rest of the table is grounded by <clears throat> the grounding clip uh, here uh, coming from the control box. The grounding clip sends a signal throughout the machine all the way to that router bit. And so there's a ground signal there. This is the input signal here. When those two make contact, it stops automatically. It's just like using the quick set block or the touch plate. And so uh, when the uh, bit comes over, uh, it, it stops uh, right when it makes kisses that face. Just, just pretty as all be it. And uh, that angle iron is simply uh, drilled. And on the four bolts, uh, it's just secured on that plate. So it's a fixed position from the center of the live center. It does not move. Its relationship is the same no matter where I put that tailstock. And I have enough slack on this 
wire here that I can move down the whole length of the fourth axis, no problem. Uh, now, on the new fourth axis is with the sliding tail stock. There's a knob that you turn and you can slide it just like on a lathe and everything. There are two posts that come up and then the, the live center, the tail stock. Uh, and in there, with that, uh, I, I would have mounted the face plate, just a single plate uh, instead of an angle iron. I would have mounted a single plate if I would have had that sliding stock. I would have mounted it and, and secured it from behind with straps behind those two, the two pipes. And I don't have a picture of the new fourth axis, what it looks like. But I, would have, I could have done the same thing and created a fixed position that does not vary, does not change, does not do anything. Um, it is wherever that tail stock goes, that live center, that relationship between the face of this and that live center is the same. Uh, so uh, yay for that. I can't, I got to stop saying that. I, I, if I get used to saying that, I'll, I'll get in trouble. All right. Yeah, uh, it's probably a trademark. All right. Now let me, uh, let me come over to the underside and y'all are going to have to excuse my sawdust mess. I've been flinging some sawdust today. But uh, I'm going to let me here. Hold on a second. I gotta, I gotta, uh, I gotta blow just a little bit of air. There's sawdust all over the place. Don't want to look like a pigsty in the shop, man. Jeez Louise. All right. So I'm gonna bring the camera with me. Um, and I'm going to squat a cop a squat right here on my little chair. Hold on a second. I got to get I'm all tangled up there, folks. Okay. Now, on the bottom side, and uh, this is a weird angle here, uh, on the uh, bottom side of the unit, my touch plate used to come out of the front of the control box, and I really can't see my monitor, so I don't know what the heck you guys are looking at. Uh, on the front of the control box, the touch plate wire and ground came out and, you know, went into uh, this area here. You know, or it went to the touch plate and stuff into the gator clip and everything. Well, my ground wire, which is this black wire right here, is coming straight from the ground of the control board all the way over to the gator clip that clips on the leg of the table sending the ground signal through. My input number two wire comes up into the bottom of this terminal, and I really hope you all can see this, uh, but it comes up to the bottom of this terminal, uh, and then it's daisy chained, uh, making each one of these terminals active. Um, so that input two signal is now active for each one of these. Now my first one here coming in from the bottom, that's the fourth axis. My second one is going to be the DWC quick set. And my first one's going to be my touch plate. Uh, and uh, I have it simply uh, drilled and tapped uh, secure to here. Uh, and it uh, no longer have this big red wire, you know, everywhere with splices in the wire and everything. I've got a nice clean little system going on there. Uh, so I will, and if I ever wanted to put any more inputs of some, for some other reason, I don't know, uh, maybe I wanted to put another one, uh, for my DWC joint maker jig, you know, a little touch button and, or whatever, uh, I could. Um, but, uh, so I've, uh, you know, I got that now when it came to, let's get back over to here and then I'll answer some questions and all that stuff, but let's get back over to here, uh, uh, to this. Uh, and I'm going to bear with me a second while I reach over and grab some things. When I was trying to determine, all right, how do I want to make this? What do I want to do? How do I want it to be? And, and all of that stuff. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, brass is brass going to be conductive because, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of copper in it, but it's made up a bunch of other types of metals and all, and it's not really the best metal for con conductivity uh, and everything, but it, it's, conductive enough and it's beautiful a nice sensor and everything now when i and i'm going to switch cameras uh one more time sorry about the camera change and then we will um we will uh talk or i will answer your questions i promise you um hey how you doing so 
I when I bought the um here's what all I bought. So I bought a small roll of uh, 14 gauge um, uh, two strand wire, uh, strand of wire. So it, it's basically uh, lamp wire, if you will, right? Um, and I only used one string. So I split the, where's my end of my wire at here? So I split, you know, split it down the middle and I only needed one side of it and everything. Uh, but uh, by buying this small roll for nine bucks, uh, it uh, gave me twice the length because I'm only using one of the wires and all. Uh, and so I got that. And then I got one of these little terminals here. Uh, these little terminals like you saw down there. And hopefully you saw that uh, uh, down there, the wiring and all. I was holding the camera trying to get it to hold still. But then I was thought, okay, how do I want to mount it to the fourth axis? Uh, so at first I was going to mount it to the head of the fourth axis uh, and um, uh, thought, well, no, that's not good because not everybody can do that. Not everybody's CNC goes over the front of the table uh, when I say the head, that's the box, the motor box, not everybody's CNC goes over the front of the table. So it really wouldn't apply. So I need to come up with a good idea. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to make a, uh, angle, angle bracket and, uh, you know, I'm going to span. I got, I got all this unistrut stuff, right? I was going to, you know, all this heavy duty crap here. And I was going to span this across the fourth axis. I was going to bolt this to it, but I needed four inches of height. So I was going to bolt this to it and put the button on there and all that stuff. And uh, it was stupid. That was a bad idea. So I didn't do that. Uh, and so when I got back to the house and I was laying out the unit strut and all, I was like, man, that looks like trash. Uh, you know, uh, I need something that looks just a little bit cleaner. It's not, it's not the greatest. If I painted it black where it blended in, except for that brass, then maybe, you know, right. But it's just silver. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, that $9 roll of wire, the uh, $1.17 three quarter inch plug, the uh, $3 brass cap, uh, some little uh, connectors, little uh, connectors, or little eyelet connectors. Uh, that's all I ended up using out of everything that I bought. I bought like a hundred and something dollars worth of stuff. I was trying all, all kinds of weird things. Uh, and, um, and also, uh, you know, I might take it back to Lowe's, who knows, but, uh, or I might use it in the future on something else, but, uh, I needed, there, there's two main requirements when you're putting in something like that. One, it's gotta be consistent, consistent, consistent on the touch off. Uh, you know, it can't be varying cause then that's wasting my time. If it varies, if it's just floating and it's movable or, or what have you, uh, then I'm always having to measure the distance between it and the center of my stock to get the number and all that. I need a fixed distance, no matter where I put that tail stock, no matter what state, uh, what it, uh, uh, what position it's in, uh, it's the relationship between the tip of the cap and the center of that live center does not change. Um, and so there we go. Now, let me grab a block. Cause someone asked about how I find center and all that stuff. Uh, some very simple things. So, uh, give me just a second. I'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Okie dokie, dokie dokie. All right, now I got to be careful what buttons I push on that. Okay, so uh, let's get back over to the other camera. Man, I need a camera person. <laughs> okay, and uh, let's get that camera. Ooh. Don't you go falling off on me. Let me see where I'm at here. Can you guys see that okay? All right. I promise I'll come to answer your questions in a minute. Uh, so this is another piece of uh, maple burl that I have. Might make a little brother to whatever that piece of wood is. And that, that piece is pretty. Um, but, uh, basically, 
the first thing is, is orientate your piece to what's going to be, you know, between centers, right? Uh, how is it going to get orientated and everything? Uh, from there, uh, very simply, uh, you know, I have just a very simple uh, angle uh, protractor, whatever you want to call it, a little uh, angle marking gauge and uh, corner to corner and mark the center and center marks the spot. OK, so just your line marks and everything, just like if you were making the center of your board, if you were carving on the table uh, from there, once that center mark is made, uh, then I use a simple punch uh, to punch a hole or not a hole, but a little indentation. Um, and I take my spur drive. I take my spur drive here uh, out of the fourth axis and uh, I come over here put it inside that little dimple and there's no dimple there, but put it inside that dimple and I whack the shit out of it with a mallet to uh, bury those spurs into that top. Okay. Uh, so it really grips. And then I put my uh, spur drive back in. I can seat this into those four indentations on those teeth. Uh, and then on my back side, I can bring my tail stock in and poke it right into the center mark that I have on the other side, tighten her down and, uh, you know, uh, we're good to go. So while I'm here, let's take a look. So this is the roughing stage. Uh, so this is what's left of the roughing stage I have from here to here that we're going to carve in just a second. We're going to get it running again. Uh, but the uh, finish stage on this, uh, let me see here, let me get it in the screen here. Uh, the, the finish so far uh, on that, uh, this is right on the CNC, it's in the middle of carving, so there's no uh, sanding or anything yet. Uh, but uh, hopefully y'all can see that pretty well. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm pretty happy with uh, that that detail. And once it's finished carving here in just a few minutes, we'll uh, take a look and see how our seam came out. Now, if we dig in very close to here, uh, in some of these radiuses, I don't know how well y'all can see it, in some of these radiuses and stuff, I could have used my 16th inch ball nose bit and really, really got down in there and got some pretty detail and stuff. But again, I would have doubled my carving time. Uh, so I'm very happy with this, uh, the way it looks. Uh, it's, I mean, just, uh, this is right off the CNC, no sanding. So uh, really, really pretty finish. All right. So, uh, but that button, like I said, that's my little cap right there, my little touch button. And uh, it works like a champ and uh, probably could have gotten it all uh, under 15 bucks if I wouldn't have went and hog wild and bought everything thinking, Maybe this will work. Maybe that'll work. Maybe this will work. Now, the one thing I did invest in, uh, which I didn't really have in the shop, and I think everybody should have in the shop. Uh, well, uh, I did invest in a very small, inexpensive uh, $30 tap and die set uh, for thread tapping and all. And um, yeah, and you'll notice there's a blank space right there in one. Broke the tap right out of the gate cheap little fuckers. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but um, yeah, so this is going to be my next piece that I'll carve that nice, nice piece of burl there. All right, let me get you set back up here. Sorry, uh, Michael, if you're watching, bud. Don't, don't listen to what I'm saying. All right. Let's get uh, set back up here and let's get this thing finishing its uh, toolpath while we're talking and I'm answering questions and all that stuff. Um, so if you did not make any kind of little button and all, right, the normal touch off procedure is to bring the bit in and touch off on the side of the tail stock. Uh, that is a one inch diameter tail stock. Let me uh, get back over here. Um, the outside diameter is the one inch uh, diameter tailstock. You would bring and kiss the bit up to that and you would program in your 0.5 uh, because you're half inch away uh, from center. But with this diameter of stock, uh, just you can see there's some distance there to get to. And with the short bits, it's just not happening. So you've got to come up with a way to uh, 
do a touch off that it's consistent and everything, especially when you're working off center. And this was my DIY solution that I did last night. Uh, and uh, I didn't get a chance to finish uh, hooking up my little touch plate and, and my um, quick set, but I'll do that as soon as I'm done with class tonight. Uh, it'll take probably about uh, 20 minutes or so. And um, yeah, there we go. So what I'll do is uh, in the Spindle TV uh, group, uh, I'll drop that little 15 minute roughing, uh, uh, roughing, you know, and, and finish cut that I did a little fast forward video. Uh, there won't be any sound to it. It'll just be kind of something. If you want to check that out, uh, you're more than welcome to. And, uh, all right, now, now I've got to, uh, switch back to this front camera here. And here's where, uh, the, um, uh, what's that term? Something where here's where the blank meets the road. Well, I'm going to say here's where the butter meets the bun. <laughs> I've got to uh, alter my G code to be able to start back at that line uh, so that my when when my CNC doesn't know like kind of what speeds and feeds it should be traveling at on this 3D cut. When it, when it runs into those lines of those F codes that I put in there, uh, it will balance out and go. Uh, so you may not experience this with other controllers and things, but especially when you have a spindle uh, and everything and you're in, you have, you're in the middle of a run uh, where there's no feed speeds, spindles codes and all, and you want to stop in the middle of the night so you can pick up the next day. This may help you. This may help you. Uh, with what you need to do, what you're going to see me do here uh, in just a second. Uh, so now let's, before I do the alteration of the G code, let me come back here and uh, let me see what you guys were talking behind my back about. Cause I couldn't see none of your chats. I'm just kidding. Much better, much better. Okay. So sorry, I'm late. Jim, Jim, you're always late, man. All right, guys, get on to Jim for being late. I'm just kidding. Um, that's a great idea. You're a genius. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, Crystal. Thanks. I am a genius. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it uh, it it uh, it works, right? Uh, you know, I've, I I could have went on Amazon and bought a touch sensor button. I could have figured out a way to mount it. Uh, uh, and everything. And, and those touch sensors button, they have gator clips that you have to clip on the bit when you touch off and all that. There's no clipping the gator clip on the bit and all the ground runs through the table, uh, through the unit and, uh, right to the bit. And so when I touch my sensor, it, it sets it off and everything and all that wonderful jazz. So no doing that. So, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, Robert, uh, Casa, says, do you have to check your router for square to the table or the fourth axis when switching back and forth uh, between axes? Well, it's a good idea to do that, right? I never check it uh, because uh, I know the rule of thumb. That swivel plate has a 90 degree and a zero stop. Okay. As long as I, when I pivot that up, that little U hook goes around the bolt on that hook and if as long as I'm seated on that bolt and tighten everything down there, then I'm at zero. Same thing when I'm at 90. I don't have to check it. If I'm not, then I make the appropriate adjustments to my CNC machine so that I am every time I go into normal mode, mill mode, fourth axis mode. When I turn it, I don't want to have to second guess. So I'm going to test if I'm not. I'm going to see what I need to adjust. If let's say the powder coat on the, uh, the swivel plates a little too thick, right? Some I get a little heavy handy in the powder coat oven, right? And so that I'm not quite at when I, when I'm hooking and one way or another on that bolt, I'm not quite, I'm just off a of 90 or I'm just off a of zero. Uh, well then I'm going to take it upon myself to do a little bit of shave out there. So, and I'm going to sneak up on it and I'm going to tweak it until when I hit that hook, I am 90 and zero positive stop. No way around. No if, ands or buts about it. And uh, I'm going to set my machine up to make it easy for me. So I don't have to second guess it. Uh, now, 
if you get yourself up uh, into zero position back in the mill mode and you notice you're you're getting little groove lines in your carving and stuff and all like the uh, it's out of tram. That's the key word, tram, uh, you know, uh, then, uh, you know, you're, you're, you need to make those adjustments or, or you need to make sure that when you swim it back up that you're, you're hooking it and you're holding it there until that bolt gets tight to lock it into place. You know, all three of those bolts uh, and stuff. So you got to, you know, it, it, you got to uh, set up your machine, make it uh, just like, you know, when you have a table saw, you're going to check that blade for run out. Uh, and if not, you're going to adjust that blade till that thing is carving perfectly. You're going to tune your machine. So tune your fourth axis, tune your CNC machine. So that way you're not second guessing it. Great question. Great question. Uh, yeah, I'm getting rid of the man glitter. I blew away all the man glitter. Um, yeah, right, John? Uh, exactly. Same thing that Crystal said, you know, genius, you know, uh, just simple, but effective. It works and it works very well. Now, if I could clean that up and turn it into a product and have it, have that button milled for the new fourth axis, even for the old ones and the retrofit and all, I'd be selling that setup. But no, I'm just telling you how to do it. Just get yourself some uh, angle iron. I think it's uh, one inch by one inch. Yeah, one inch by one inch. Uh, angle iron, do you a hole, PVC cap, brass cap on there, drill and tap a hole, put a wire to it, go down and boom, you're done. So, uh, you know, um, but yeah, if I could, you know, I love, uh, um, R and D like, you know, the, uh, joint making jig and things like that. Uh, those are things that I prototyped. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we, um, uh, hold on a second. So if we look here, hanging on the shelf, uh, you see that MDI MDF uh, thing hanging over the top of that shelf right there. It's got a saw blade on it. This saw blade is pretty cool. I cut it on the CNC and I had all the video woodworkers uh, sign it, YouTube woodworkers and all, uh, and it just hangs in my shop. Oh, not anymore. Um, but uh, that, that's the DWC joint making jig prototype right there. So um, the things like that, uh, I like RD and then I take it to Burl and say, hey, Let's manufacture it. And Burl makes it look pretty uh, and all that stuff. So uh, I, I'm on the, I like the R&D side of things, of life. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I own the CNC. It's mine. I can alter it and change it any way I want. You guys can too. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of that, let's stop for a moment just real quick to kind of uh, get off topic just for a second. Join me next week. Uh, if you want to see carving lithophanes, we're going to design. I've got two portraits that I've got to do for uh, two people, to, uh, anniversary portraits and all. Uh, so we're going to design a couple of lithophane carvings. Uh, we're going to carve them in some candle stone that arrived last week. You saw that. We're going to do that this coming this week. Uh, and then um, uh, next week, I have a choice. Hold on a second. Let me. The, um, after the lithophanes, uh, I, am going to be doing a video talking about, uh, you know, not everybody that watches me has a digital wood carver. Uh, so, but I do want to talk about some, uh, things and setups like, uh, the planet CNC software, TNG software. Uh, I want to show people how they can, if they don't have limit switches and they're like, Oh, why don't, you know, I, I hear so much about limit switches. I'm going to show you how to set up lot soft limits, uh, without limit switches. So your CNC will stop when it reaches a certain point from a fixed home position versus the variable home position that you have on the machine. Uh, I'd like to talk about that sometime, but after the lithophanes, uh, I had a, uh, knife maker make this, uh, knife for me here. Uh, and he did a, a fabulous job. It's a pretty sucker. Uh, but it's missing something, right? It's missing some handles. 
uh, he made this uh, beautiful knife for me. Uh, and I would like to customize a uh, model. Uh, some handles and really deck them out. This thing, uh, I've had it for quite a while now. Uh, the knife maker, he's uh, here in Ocala, he's local. Uh, and um, I did some carving for him. Uh, I actually carved some handles for him. And as a gift, uh, he brought me this. Uh, and it's it's a beauty. I mean, it's just, it's sweet. So I would like to do some modeling and I'd like to model uh, grip for my hands. Uh, and stuff. And uh, so there's going to be an Aspire class coming up on 3D modeling. And we're going to be making a set of knife handles for this knife. I've been wanting to do this. This thing has been floating around in a box in my shop for the longest time. And uh, I pulled it out today and said, you know what? That would be a pretty cool class. Probably maybe somebody might like it. Uh, who knows? Let me know if that's something you're interested in or might be interested in seeing. Um Let's see here. Uh, he's with his sister tonight, but thank you. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. When I apologize to Michael there, um, you definitely have some Southern. In you. <laughs> now explain to me why I have some Southern in me. Uh, Laney, are you going to use Notepad++? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to use Notepad++ to edit my G code. So you're going to see uh, that here in just two seconds. Uh, but yes, I am. Um, would you start a few G codes before you left off? Absolutely. Um, what I do is the line that I finished off at, uh, my feed and speed will uh be a couple of lines before that line. Uh, and I will start off 10 lines above that. That's kind of, there's no rhyme or reason why 10 lines above it, but I go 10 lines up. And uh, when I hit start, it goes through those lines, it hits those feeds and speeds, and then it picks up right where it left off. So uh, yes, I do not start right where I finish. Um, you know, so I will, I will be going a few lines off. Um, Michael Parrish, they're junk. Which ones are junk, buddy? Let me know which ones are junk. Um, let's see here. Could you use the touch plate instead of the copper cap? Yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, where's that touch plate? Right? Okay. If this touch plate was connected, right, it's grounded. Okay. The whole machine, all the metal on the machine is grounded because of that grounding clip, right? So if I touch this touch plate up against something, uh, a known distance, what am I doing? I'm touching the touch plate to metal. It's just like touching it to the bit. It sets off the sensor so the axis doesn't move. Now I could put something behind the touch plate, a piece of rubber or something like that. And, uh, you know, and then do that. But now I got to account for how thick or whatever it is I put on there. So by having that brass cap on that plastic plug, right, uh, it kills that ground signal isolating the brass cap from everything else and the wire going to the brass cap that's tapped in the brass cap. That is, that's my, that's my sensor. The rest of the router bit is grounded already. Uh, so when it comes in, it makes that connection. Now, if I would have screwed that brass cap right to the side of my thing with no buffer, no plastic buffer and all, uh, no insulation, if you will, uh, then that would have been defeating the person. It'd been like using this. So if I touch this up against my, my tail stock or whatever, all I'm doing is it sets the sensor off. The router doesn't move. Nothing moves. The sensor's gone. So, uh, you know, you could use the touch plate. You'd have to modify it, but why, why do that? Right. All right. Uh, let's see here. Tippy. Tippy. Great. Can you use it to do pistol grips? I've been asked to make. Yes, I've made uh, 1911 pistol grips. I've made um, uh, pistol grips for a, I think it was a 357 revolver. Uh, you know, uh, every once in a while. But yeah, absolutely, you sure can. Um, uh, you can you, the the same process that I'm going to do for modeling the knife handle uh, would be a similar process for the gun. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to take 
an image. So uh, on this, uh, we're going to have a ruler uh, next to it so we can gauge when in the photo, we can get a scale, right, of what this is. Uh, so that when I import that image into the uh, software, I can scale it based on my ruler that's laying right next to this. Uh, and I'm going when I bring it up to scale, I'm going to have the profile of the tang here uh, so that I can, you know, get my whole placement correct and my little uh, lanyard placement correct and all that stuff. Uh, and, um, you know, my back uh, rib profile, all of that. So, you know, and now the uh, when it comes to and excuse me for those of you that do not like firearms, but uh, let's unload this. So it is unloaded. Uh, one more check just for safety. Uh, when it comes to pistol grips uh, and things, uh, now this is a this is a full grip, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, account and all. But you would same thing. You would uh, have uh, the if if you could, if not, find an image or something, or find some kind of dimensions for the 1911 or whatever it is. But uh, I would do the same thing. I would have a some kind of scale measuring tape. Uh, there, uh, and I would take a ni nice clean background. You don't want your, your junk all over your workbench, a nice white background. I have, uh, these all kinds of, uh, uh, sheets. I have them in white, silver, whatever, make sure it doesn't, you know, conflict with, but this has a white side too, if I peel off the back, but, uh, I can do a nice overhead shot of whatever it is that I want to bring in. And then I can model around that, uh, and everything. And so, it uh, makes for a um, a nice uh, uh, way to scale and design based off that off that image and all. So the let me get this. Bear with me a second here, folks. Let me get the damn. All right, all right. So excuse me for a second. Okay, now the uh, thing of it is, is uh, you, whatever it is you're modeling, I don't care what it is. Uh, if you can bring that sample into your software to model off of it or design off of it, great. But if it's something big or whatever you can't, then you got to do your best to, you know, make sure. But with that knife, I'm going to be able to get my whole placement and everything just right uh, and stuff. And then uh, we'll... We'll go from there. All right. So let's get Tippy's uh, comment off of the screen. Where did your, where'd your comment go, Derek? Dibby? All right. Awesome. I have a knife. I started from a file 20 years ago. There you go. Yeah, man. Uh, so cool. Uh, put your uh, angle on it uh, and the glue acrylic. Here we go. Put your angle on it and glue acrylic. Share the files. Share what files, Ed? Follow up with that on the bottom. Uh, come on back in to a comment on that and tell me share what files are you looking to share? Uh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Didn't finish my post. Love my Second Amendment. <laughs> I do too. Um, uh, let's see here. I have, uh, oh, yep, you have the broken grips. Okay. Uh, look forward to that class. So cool. All right. All right. Now let's get back to, let's get into, we got a carve, you know, we still got time here and it's already an hour, 29 minutes into this. And I got still got, we got still weave to make. All right. So we're going to switch over to the screen and let me see if, um, let me see if, uh, let me see here. Uh, uh, I'm going to change my resolution. Give me a second here. I'm going to see if I can make it bigger for you guys so y'all can see clearly what I'm doing. Um, uh, what are we? 17, 8, uh, 1280, 720 is what you guys uh, make. Whoa, that makes that screen so big. Holy camoly. Optimal uh, resolution notification. The optimal resolution is 1920 by 10. I know it's the optimal resolution, bud, but we're showing the screen here. Jeez. 
Peter yelling at you already. Okay, uh, let's go into our uh, notepad uh, plus plus. Do I not? Let me go to Windows Accessories. Let's see if it dropped it in there. There's notepad. Oh, hang tight. Two seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on a second. Notepad. Plus. Plus. Dum, 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 dum. Stand by. Download. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I thought I had it on this computer. Ah. Download. Okay. Uh, download. Yes, download. You know what kills you is when um, when uh, they uh, have these pages and uh, they're, all the advertisements all have download buttons and you don't know. It's like you go to think you're downloading, you're downloading some funky ad. Oh, doesn't that just get your goat? All right. Show in folder. There we go. Notepad installer. English. Next. I agree. Next. Next. Install. All right. Make sure y'all are still with me. Y'all still with me? All right. Run it. Finish. Yes. Run. Done. Uh, let's minimize uh, anti-micro. That's what I use for my little controller. If anybody's curious how you assign your keys to your little gamer pad. Anti-micro. All right. So we're going to go file. Open. We're going to go to uh, documents. Desktop, not documents. Weave basket. Weave basket. 3D finish. And the reason why I'm using Notepad++ is because it gives us line numbers. Holy camoly. Notepad is a pain in the butt sometimes, but plus plus is awesome. It's like a little editor. Uh, this or Visual Studios. Um, uh, all these things uh, are great. Uh, and everything. All right, let's get this uh, going here. So we've got uh, what I want to copy from this is I want, I'm going to grab this S code, not the M3, just the S code. I want to copy that. And then my line number was 294, 160, 294. 160. So 294. Slow down there, Jack Rabbit. All right, 294,160. Got to come up just a little bit more. twos and there we go so all right so this is my line where i stopped i don't know if you guys can see what i just highlighted but it's right there uh what i want to do is uh write the line right above it i'm going to hit the enter key twice 
three times actually. I'm going to give myself some space. Okay. Uh, and uh, in that first line, I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, uh, paste that S24000. Uh, I'm going to sneak back up to the top here. And I'm going to find my feed rate, which is F15, and my plunge rate, which is F55. I don't need to copy and paste it. I can remember that. And I'm going to come back down to my uh, line of G code where my space was. 294,000. I'm sure I could in here. I, I just, uh, I probably could type in fine line this, fine line that. All right. So um, let me get back over here. All right. Oh, hang on. Passed right by her. She's a fast one there, ladies and gentlemen. All right. And so uh, S12,000, uh, your plunge rate is always uh, first. Okay. Uh, and, uh, then that is going to be, uh, followed by your, uh, feed rates. Now I did not have to make a, uh, extra line here. I could have put it right at the end of this X code. Okay. Uh, and then I could, you know, delete these spaces. I don't need to put the spaces there. Um, if uh, I needed to do a raise or something, then yeah. But on this next line of G code, uh, we're going to put, uh, F 55. And uh, that's all I need to do. I just need to get that spindle speed, that F uh, plunge rate, and that, uh, um, that, that feed rate in there. All right, so now I can go ahead and file uh, save uh, this tap file. And uh, I can minimize all of that. I can come back into my controller program and go file open my 3D finish file here. And uh, my screen is so big. Uh, let me minimize this because it's uh, it's all over both screens. Uh, there we go. Uh, and if I come down to my line of G code, the 294,000, uh, you should see the um, red Almost there. Oh, passed right by it. All right. So uh, now I'm just going to travel down here. So we have our feed and speed right there, our speed and feed and all. So what I'm going to do now is, you know, uh, 294,160 is where I finished off, right? But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go up, you know, uh, 10 lines or so. Uh, and I'm going to right click, right click, and I'm going to tell the CNC to move to the selected line XY. Not selected line, because that'll take me to my Z2, but the selected line XY. All right, so when I do that, uh, let's see if we can change cameras here. We'll go to the uh, CNC cam here. And let's back it up just a bit. So when I right click on this line of G code, I'm going to let's split the view. There we go. Uh, when I right click on that line of G code and say move to selected line X, Y, uh, it's going to bring the routers X into position and uh, the Y move to, but you can barely see it because it's only 10 lines up. Uh, now I'm going to put my dust hose back into uh, place. And now in the software, coming back to the software, uh, I could on that uh, line of G code um, that... 10 lines up, line of G code up here. 
where I told it to move to, I could right click on it and say start from select line and it would turn the router on and it'll go carving. I want the router, especially if I have a water cooled spindle, I want the spindle building up uh, uh, and there's a 10 second delay to get it up to full RPM. So what I do is I turn the router on. So we're going to hear the router come on. And then I right click and tell it to start from the selected line. Okay. Uh, now before I do that, let's get the camera on. Okay. So start from selected line. Now it's going to get into position and once it hits that G code, it'll go ahead and level out. So just that quick, it, it's F codes and everything, it's going to start leveling out. Let me get the camera set up a little bit better. And so it's going to be finishing carving. So while that's finishing up its carving um, uh, and everything, I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, my timer on my computer program says um, an hour and three minutes, uh, but that's not true. Uh, so uh, it could be. Who knows? It's stepping over 8% of the bit, but no, it should be pretty quick. Um, all right. Let's see here. Uh, Ed, okay, you came back and followed up with that 1911 for the uh, the files. Unfortunately, bud, I cannot do that. Uh, the when a customer uh, when it's a commission job uh, and everything, and they uh, I create a uh, a model for them uh, based on their firearm and and things like that, and uh, I give it to them. They get their fi those files and everything too, and the rights. I do not keep those. Uh, um, or I cannot, I, I do not give those away, but, uh, you know, it's something we could probably, you know, make again, uh, in the future. But, um, uh, if I had them, I'd give them to you. But, uh, when I do commission work, uh, the, uh, person that pays me owns the rights to all of that. Let's see here. What do I got? You can change it up first so uh it looks like visual studios or html yep you can uh i uh would just downloading it and all it had its raw uh look to it but uh yeah it's a i love notepad plus plus uh it's a great little editor uh and everything because i my hobby my my profession is woodworking but my hobby is code writing so um i use that dreamweaver um the uh, Visual Studio Basics, or Visual Studio, Visual Studio, not necessarily Basics, but yeah, man. All right, let's see here. Uh, you are good. I would be saying a lot of F codes to do what you did. <laughs> F codes, right? Uh, so, yeah, so it's going to come through, and it's carving that finish, that little basket. It's going to be a pretty-looking little basket when it's all said and done. I keep calling it a basket. It's not. It's only big enough to hold a couple of cookies. It'll be a pretty cool cookie jar if I hollow it out. Um, why did you have to input the speed uh, and plunge depth if you start uh, 10 lines before? Uh, so... I start 10 lines before Charles uh, so that it, it I don't want to start right on those F codes. Uh, I want it to start before that. So when it, because it takes just a blink of an eye for it to reach those 10 lines, those 10 lines are nothing in a millisecond. It reaches those. So it hits those, uh, those codes and it levels out. Um, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to start right where the F codes are and things like that. Uh, you know, I want to give it a chance to get caught up to it and, and all. So, but uh, I have to put those in, especially if I had a water-cooled spindle, because 
the thing it would be running really slow and kind of jittery like like okay what speed do i go what speed do i go what what rpms am i supposed to be turning and when it hits when it finds those f codes and s codes then it levels out well they're not in a 3d carving tool path they're at the beginning that's it so i had to put them in there too because i stopped now if i would have just hit unpause and wouldn't have showed you guys uh the little button and all that stuff and everything then i could have just hit unpause and we could have been moving on but by hitting stop it's either start back at the beginning or start where i left off and i prefer to start where i left off since it's a five hour carving so i need those codes from the beginning into the middle somewhere where i'm starting from all right f-bombs Uh, let's see here. I knew you had Southern and you can take random things and put them together to make them work. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Uh, for sure. Um, all right. What do we got here? Could you use the MDI to set feed and speed using the F and S commands before starting the required line of G code? Uh, haven't tried this. Just a thought. Well, I can... Uh, you, I could probably could type in uh, S24000, F15, F55, hit enter and program that in and hit start. I've never tried it. We could give it a try one day and see if it works. And uh, But uh, it's a good possibility. Yeah. Uh, I always just edit the G code. But uh, I've never tried it. You probably could. The MDI, for those of you that aren't familiar, that's the manual data input. Uh, it's at the bottom right of the uh, screen where you can type in uh, G codes and everything. So, cool. Good question, Steve. All right. Any other questions uh, while we watch this go? Um, and uh, you can see. Uh, how it's just racing through those lines of G code and everything. Now, my timer says 52 minutes to finish up those lines of G code. Uh, probably so, maybe not. I don't know, but um, I'm hoping it gets done, or else I should have let it run a little bit longer um, before pausing it uh, for the video. I wanted, to, I almost, I wanted to get it completely done or almost done. So we could talk about it, but uh, I'm hoping it doesn't take 58 minutes. I think my timer is a little bit off. Uh, it's moving along pretty decent. So I would say probably maybe 20 minutes or so. But uh, in the meantime, let's switch back to that. So how will you hollow it out? So as I said, uh, if I do cut that top off, I actually have a, enough height on my CNC in the mill mode that I could um, uh, do a pocketing cut to mill down a certain depth and stuff. Uh, or I can take it over to my lathe and chuck it up on my lathe and use my hollowing tools. But my lathe, I gave it away to someone, uh, a friend of mine, so I'd have to go to his garage to do that. Or I could uh, literally uh, take a Forstner bit uh, or, uh, you know, a spade bit and I could drill and bore down and get rid of a bunch of waste there and all. And then I could come back and follow up with some rotary tools, Dremel tools and things like that. And I could go in there and clean it up. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that I could approach the hollowing aspect on this. Which one of those will I do? Well, uh, of course, the first one I'm going to try is on my CNC machine. I'm going to mount it, clamp it on, you know, after I cut the top off. Uh, I'll clamp it on my CNC machine, and I'll create a pocketing tool path that will pocket out uh, most of that. Uh, and then as I, you know, that's a straight pocket down. If I want it to follow the curve, then I'm going to have to get in there with my Dremel or what have you. So, great question. Um you know, I could, uh, uh, if I didn't have enough height on my CNC, I could leave it in fourth axis mode. I could create a jig that held it 90 degrees from the position it's in right now. And I could let my fourth axis go in there and hollow it out. But the fourth axis uh, can't move up and down. Uh, it remain, You know, when you're in fourth axis mode, you remain in that A position. 
Uh, there's not a lot of clearance between the bottom of that router and the table to move up and down. So I wouldn't get a good, I'd get a nice slit cut in there, but I wouldn't get it uh, hollowed out. Um, but I could raise it up. I would just have to jack my jig up, you know, make my jig a little higher that holds the part so that I could move up and down side to side and then I could pocket it out. Um, what's your longest bit for hollowing? So, you know, most of my bits are the standard uh, three inch overall bits. Um, I do uh, somewhere uh, in the shop, I do have a uh, extended length bit, uh, which I believe is four and a half inches in length, but they actually go up to like six inches. But I don't have that kind of height. I don't have that kind of um, height uh, in, when I'm in mill mode. I only have a certain clearance from the top of the table, the wasteboard, should I say, to the bottom of the router. Uh, so I can't use those long bits. Now, in this fourth axis orientation, 90 degrees, I do. I can raise my router up in that uh, A position that's up and down. I could raise it up so I can move the full uh, depth and width of the throat of that that jar and i could make a jig to hold it cradle it and i could turn it 90 degrees cradle it uh clamp it in and i could pocket it out in a in this 90 degree orientation that my table is currently in now crystal you have um you have the uh oops you have a the shop saber, which has, I believe, a seven or eight inch uh, Z clearance, maybe even more. Uh, you have a lot of clearance uh, on between your gantry and your table, so you could absolutely uh, clamp this thing on the table and uh, pocket it out with your CNC, one hundred percent. Uh, because your shop saber is commercial, it's it's got a lot a lot deeper throat, uh, you know, uh, Z clearance. So you could absolutely do that with an extended length bit and everything. So, so two sided tape wouldn't work uh, for this. Uh, if it was sitting up on end, uh, you would want to. Uh, for me, I would probably uh, take a uh, two by six. Um, and, uh, I would uh, have my CNC pocket out a diameter or, or cut out a diameter that would, um, be just smaller than the diameter of this jar. Then I'd take it over to my bandsaw and split that two by six and a half. And that gives me two, uh, halves that I can clamp together with clamps, uh, to wrap around that vase. And then I would, uh, screw those boards down, those two by fours down. Uh, once they're clamped tight and they're gripping this sh crap out of that thing, then I would screw them uh, down to my waste board, and that's how I would clamp it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? Now is the time, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any other questions, uh, now is the time to ask. This is the uh, perfect opportunity to ask. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to me for a minute. How y'all doing? Uh, and I'm going to open up you guys see me hello all right just had to look over my CNC make sure everything was good um, I'm going to open up OSB so we can have both me and the machine running so stand by uh, OSB Studio, where are you hiding? Right there. So, thank you. You're the best. All right, I appreciate that. I'm going to throw that up on the screen just because I want everybody else to see it. No, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, guys, now's the time to ask if you have any questions about fourth axis or more questions about uh, the controller program and or anything. Um, no. I bought the corner plate. It came with a three inch wire, no directions. Uh, you clip the three inch wire to your flat touch plate. The gator clip goes on there. So the transfer signal transfers from that to the quick set block. So that's what that wire, it clamps right onto your touch plate, right on the flat touch plate. Now, um, if you uh, wanted, uh, you know, a longer wire, put one on there, right? It's just a 14 gauge wire. Uh, you can throw a gator clip on there if you still want to clamp to your touch plate, or you can wire it into uh, something like uh, I set up. You know, this is at Lowe's uh, all day long, these little terminal blocks. You can cut however many off that you want. You could set it up to where your touch plate wire and your uh, quick set wire go into that. And you have length for both of them to move them wherever you want. Uh, and uh, you can wire it into your box. Or this already has a length of wire. Just clip the little gator clip to that and uh, you're good. That's what it's designed for. As far as instructions in the controller program, uh, your Planet CNC program, there are uh, control buttons for touching off. And uh, if um, Charles Wallace, you're a customer of Digital Woodcarver, uh, you would call me up and I'll walk you right through how to use that touch plate. Yep. Yeah, there's no directions on it. It's uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's an XYZ block, but how do you use the buttons? How do you use, you know, how do you get it to do what you want it to do without manually touching off? You can take your pendant, and move over and touch, come around, touch, set your X and Y, touch off your Z, but we want to automate it, right? So we have controls inside the program that will automate that. And uh, I'll be happy to show you that. You can call me tomorrow if you want. Don't call me right now. I'm, I'm live. All right. Sorry, guys, I needed that. Okay, let us uh, let me get my OBS camera up so we can see it carved so y'all are got some action in the background. Action Jackson here. Uh, let's see here. And let's add in a uh, audio, 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 media, video capture device. That be the one. All right, give me two seconds to transform. There we go. And now I can. Hold on, I'm not done yet. Add a cam. All right, bring that screen up. All righty. Whoa, dude. All right. Uh, let's see here. 
Hey, Michael Bell, how you doing? Michael's like, I'm going to slip in at the last minute and uh, see what Laney's up to tonight. Um, uh, we are, we are, guys, we're coming. If y'all can hang out with me just a little bit longer, we're coming to the end of this. Remember, it's only stepping over 8% of that eighth inch diameter bit, uh, so which is like a point zero zero. One three something like that. uh um one one point zero zero one so one thousandths of an inch a human hair is three thousandths of an inch so put that in perspective and that that tight step over is so we get fine detail I don't like to sand too much when I'm done this thing will be pretty ready to go when it's right off the CNC there will be a little bit of uh defuzzing uh and things like that but uh, yeah. All right. Y'all still alive out there? Give me a hell yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Don't cuss. Just kidding. I get demonetized. No, these aren't these aren't monetized. <laughs> None of my videos are. My uh, other channels monetized. This one's not. This is all free. So speaking of that, if uh, any of you ever need one-on-one -on -one training in your Vetric software, hit me up, Spindle TV. You can reach me... Uh, uh, Laney.Shaughnessy at SpindleTV.com. I can direct you to. I do have subscription programs. You can pay $10 a month for an hour a month of training and two free projects or $110 a year for 12 hours of training and 24 free projects. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Support me, man. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, no, uh, training, if you ever need any training, that's a good resource. One-on-one, -on -one, your video, your training sessions recorded. Uh, you get that video emailed to you. So you have a video to refer back to, uh, and, um, you get me one-on-one -on -one for however long you, you need. All right. Let's see here. What does it say here? Can you cut? cups or shot glasses with yours can you cut cups or shot glasses now you're talking about can i make them out of wood can i make cups and shot glasses absolutely uh can i take a cup or a shot glass and engrave on it with a diamond bit yeah i, I yeah I could, as long as i could mount it in the fourth axis i could do that um uh you know could I take the laser engraver uh, with some uh, die coat? What's it called? Uh, laser coat. I don't know what it's called. Uh, and uh, uh, laser engrave on a Yeti cup or something? Probably so. Uh, there's all kinds of things that we could try. But yes. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So hopefully y'all can hear me over the router. It's a little bit... Uh, uh, noise here tonight. It's got sawdust in the uh, armature and stuff because it's been sucking up dust. I don't have the vacuum collection going, so uh, I got to blow it out. And all that jazz. But it's coming around the bin. We're just, we're, we're only, I mean, you guys can see that little strip left. We're like almost there. If you can hang out with me, I'm here for the duration if you are. Um, but uh, uh, I'm no expert, but getting better watching your videos. Awesome. There you go. That's, that's what I like uh, to hear. So hopefully something in these long, long, long videos... Hopefully something sticks because they are long um, and all. Now, Robert, if you make the touch button, could you use an alligator clip to connect your touch plate as opposed to wire it directly? Yes. Yeah. Just like if just like the gator clip to the quick set tool. You sure could. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what they're talking about on the quick set uh, zeroing tool, which is I'm looking around like a chicken with my head cut off because 
it's hiding here. When you, um, let's switch sides with the camera here for a second. When you get the DWC quick set tool, it's got a wire attached to it. Uh, and at the end of the wire is a gator clip. Uh, all that, all this is, is this is just a sensor block. So the gator clip clips on to the touch plate and it, the signal that's in the touch plate just gets transferred over to the block. Very simple. Nothing to it. Um, I have mine getting wired to my little terminal block, right? That my sensor and my fourth axis little button is uh, uh, working off of. You know, it's just that signal. It's that continuity signal uh, and everything. So um, it's getting thinner. I can hear the pieces cracking off. Um, the uh, So if I had my little button... And a little wire coming from the button with a gator clip on it. I could clip it right to my touch plate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, make sure the touch plate is not touching anything metal. Okay. We don't want that button. At, we want it active as far as the signal, but we don't want it locking up the axes until the router bit touches it. Right. So. No, no, not the sawdust. <laughs> that's funny yeah there is lots of sawdust I, i'm blowing everything into that corner of the table of the shop uh and there's a pile of it there so there's man glitter galore um let's uh switch back lee leaving the motors energized for overnight hours in a pause state is not hard on the motors no um it's not. So uh, the motors are in brake mode. You know, they're going to get warm uh, and everything. Your control box, uh, as long as the fan's running or the fan under your mini carver, if you have a mini carver and all, uh, it's just like that control box is like a computer. Uh, your desktop computer uh, in, in my office never shuts off. Every once in a while, I shut it down because I clean it, right? I blow out the dust bunnies and all that stuff and everything. But other than that, it's on 24-7. Same thing with that. It's like a computer. Uh, it's running 24-7. Now, uh, I wouldn't want the controller running 24-7 constantly because to the motors, I don't want, you know, they, they warm them up. They're in brake mode. So they're, they're working right there, you know. But leaving it overnight uh, to continue a job the next day, that's preferred. You don't shut it off. You leave it running. So, no, no, no problem with that at all. Sawdust does mean work is being done. And, you know, I'm kind of enjoying the in the shop personally for myself. I'm kind of uh, uh, being uh, selfish because uh, it allows me to actually get back and carve on my CNC um, and, and, and do some carving. And it makes me it, – it puts – Every design or every project that I talk with you about, rather than it just being a design, now it's a design that you go out, you know, later that week and carve it, you know, take that, what came out of your imagination or whatever you created and turn it into a reality. And I love that. I love that. So I kind of, I'm kind of liking these in the shops. Uh, I want to keep them uh, minimal as far as time, but I do want to let this run out. Uh, we are almost there, guys. That strip is getting smaller and smaller. I want to be able to hold it in my hand and show it to you up close. So hang in there with me. We got 44 holding strong. While you're sitting there holding strong, go over that video, uh, click that like button. And if you're new to uh, Spindle TV, subscribe, hit that notification bell, do all that wonderful stuff. Support your man, right? Come on. Come on. Give me some love. But... Um, yeah no i appreciate all of you uh so we're getting there i mean it's coming right down to the wire i love when it does that last peel and that last piece peels right off and flakes right off which is coming up it's almost there um what happens if you lose power if you lose power you reset you do exactly what we did wherever you lost power um here's what's going to happen right the uh, I'm watching my control panel to see kind of the lines are racing through, but I know what general area I'm in. When I lose power, the machine's going to stop, but the computer's still running because it has a battery backup, right? There's nothing coming 
from the machine to the computer saying, hey, I've stopped, right? So what we got to do is um, <laughs> where the machine stopped, we're going to uh, step back and punt. We're going to come back. That program was still running. So X, Y, and Z are lost. They're gone. Okay. So I'm going to come back in and uh, I'm going to uh, put my uh, uh, end mill in uh, or my V bit or, or some kind of bit because I got to get my X first. And my X, if I can point, I wonder if my mouse shows. Yeah. My X split, you see this kind of defined line right here? That defined line? My bit at the beginning of that piece, half of the bit was on and the board and half of it was off, right? So that's my defining line right here, this little top piece. It hasn't been carved away. It's only carved a little radius to it. Um, so I just got to reset my X, try to get the best that I can. We're getting closer, guys. Try to get the best I can. Why? Y is um, tricky, trickier, because now this thing has a pattern in it, right? Y's got to get exactly uh, uh, correct uh, and, and, and stuff, uh, but the machine stopped. So I've got to really, really do some thinking, uh, you know, on my model, on my tool path, I have what's called in the program, there's what's called a hover. So I can zoom into my design and I can... Uh, click an area it'll highlight that area and it'll highlight the line of g-code that it is and I can turn my uh, spindle to that area uh, and you're like they all look the same how do you know what area it is from my seam I can count back the beads right to find that area and I can highlight that and get that line of g-code and I can turn my CNC and I can bring my bit up to it to make sure it's cutting right on that area and then once I'm there, it can zero out the Y, and then I can come back and touch off my Z, and I'm ready to kind of pick up and go. And I'm going to pick up from that line of G-code that I hovered over and clicked on. So a little bit of work involved to recover, but it's doable. It's You don't have to trash it. We're getting right at the end, guys. It's about to say, it's about to go out. Um, but uh, it's very doable. I'm going to back this camera up just a little bit. So we can watch the uh, CNC back away and all that stuff. Um, it's really doable. Uh, it's going to overcut by about an eighth of an inch. Uh, there's that seam and, and all, but a uh, little bit of work. Now, if I was carving on the flat table, right, my project, power goes out, easy to recover. I can take a tape measure, stretch it across my board, find my, if I'm working off the center, you know, find the center, measure, find the center. Touch off the Z on the top of the material, and I'm good to go. If I'm working off the corner of the board, get that bit back on the corner. Put that quick set block back on there. If you got one of those, touch it off, or just get that bit on the corner. Touch off your Z. You're ready to go. Fourth axis, depending on the detail and the design, you find that uh, key spot. So it's giving us a little show. It's going to say, hey, look what we did. It's traveling all the way back, and then it's going to shut down. Uh, so we got a little spin. It did a little fancy little spin like it was in a dress or something. What's up with that? Um, but um, uh, we uh, we can recover. Uh, you know, the power goes out. Uh, you just have to understand if you're running off of a laptop, your laptop's got a battery backup. See, uh, CNC doesn't. Now, it's a 110 volt CNC here. Uh, you know, um, uh, you literally could... Uh, put an UPS system. You know, people have UPS systems in their office, UPS systems uh, in their office uh, to back up computers and, you know, power supply. Like if the power goes out, the computers will stay on for, you know, however many, 15 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever. They don't shut down so you don't lose all your stuff. It gives you enough time to save your work and all before you have to close it down. You could put an UPS system on your CNC. Now for your 220 systems and stuff like that, You'd have to find something that was compatible with that. But uh, I don't have an up system or anything like that. It's just you can recover. You can do it. I have faith in you. All right. So um, I've learned a lot tonight. Thanks for all you do. You're welcome, Robert. I appreciate you. Um, but uh, now you're now Camaro, you asked the question about what happens if you lose power. You have a 220 uh, CNC. Uh, they're probably expensive, but they probably do make up systems for... Uh, 
um, uh, for uh, uh, systems that big or something and all. But, you know, an up system is designed for a computer and all, but it can handle it. It can handle it. It's only a 110. You know, it's just like a computer. The control box is just like a computer um, and all that. All right. So that way, if the power does go out, everything's still running in simultaneously. It gives you time to pause the program. Shut down the spindle, you know, and uh, wait for the power to come back on because you don't want to run the CNC off the up system. Uh, and when everything comes back on, uh, you're good. You, you've got your position. Nothing's no, nothing's moved. Uh, and uh, when power comes back on, then you can run again, right? All right. So let's get this thing off of the uh, – let's get this thing off of the – Bear with me a second. Looking good, looking good. All right. All right, let me get my... Uh, That program does not like when I pause or stop um, for some odd reason. Hang tight there, Jelly Beans. Dum, 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 dum. Dum, dum, dum. All right. Uh, let's back up the, let's get back to our main camera here. Let's get back to, um, where's it at? Where's our main camera at? There we go. And, uh, Hang tight right there while I take the piece off, and then we'll take a look at her. All right, let's bring that. Uh, the thing about the... Um, Let me turn my speed up. All right, let's get back to the camera here. <clears throat> okay. Man glitter, man glitter. It's like dust everywhere. Holy cow. <laughs> Where's your dust mask at, Lainey? All right. Okay, let's get back to... Oh, I do that every time. Let's get back to uh, me here. All right. So, take a real quick sip of Seven Up or Sprite. All right. So, uh, here is our final piece. There's those little spur holes. There's my center. You can even see the pencil mark still in there. Right. Um, so, 
Uh, got a little bit of uh, cool little detail on the bottom where those little ribbons start and all. And here is my seam right here. So what I want you to notice is uh, from, from this view, it doesn't look like much, right? But if it would have had the other half or the third ribbon, if I would have done the model a little bit differently and had the third part, you know, it's a three, you know, three bead. If I'd have had the third bead here, it wouldn't uh, just trim it off flat. It would have, you know, blended it in with the uh, rest. And of course, you know, make my spacing. So I got my grids there. But if I turn it to the side this way, you can see the seam there, right? Uh, so uh, this will just take a little fine, uh, where's it? Where, my finger's way off, uh, right? right right here so you can see my scene uh and um it's because that third bead isn't there it's flat it doesn't round over you know like the others do so if i would have had that third strand or that third bead, i'm pointing way over here uh third bead here uh it would have blended right in and all uh wouldn't notice it but as far as the other seam up here right so can you see the seam at the top on the neck very barely. You see that line right there? Uh, for those of you that might not be able to see it, let me point to it right here. Nope, right there at the tip of my finger that's moving all over the place because I can't coordinate. But pretty cool little little vessel there. Pretty, pretty cool. Um so I'm going to take it, uh, I'll take it over to the bandsaw and well, I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, but right here, the, I made that model, uh, so that this lip round it, it, first of all, that lip was to finish off the, uh, beads, you know, so it gave it a nice finish, but then it also rounds off into, uh, here. So I have a little bit of a round over there. And so I'm going to cut right uh, to that. And I'll have to, when I cut it on the band, so I'll have to kind of finesse that, that edge again a little bit. Uh, but that'll cut this cap from there. So it'll sit down and, and I'll probably do a little, little slight bit of taper, uh, sanding a slight amount, just so that when it does sit in there, it kind of seats in there. It'll be just, it's not going to be like a press, like a cork, you know, or anything like that. It'll just sit on there. Uh, and all. Uh, and then, you know, this could probably get some stain maybe or uh, a finish. So what would you do? Would you stain it? Would you finish it? What would you do? Um, not knowing what type of wood it is, and I will find out what type of wood it is. Uh, I really don't know. I want to call it, I want to say it's uh, uh, maple, but it's not. Uh, it might be a soft maple, but I don't think it is. Not the way that it... Uh, you know, carves, cut, and machined, uh, and, and all. But man, right off the CNC, really clean. Now, if I zoom in here, let it focus, let it focus. Uh, if I had a 16th inch ball nose bit, uh, I could have probably gotten some really, really fine detail on those uh, uh, beads and all, but I'm happy with that. And you'll see there's little fuzzies, right? Wait, hold on, where is that right here? You can see uh, right here, there's fuzzies and all kind of like, you know, in some of the little nooks and crannies. Uh, but other than that, that's pretty damn nifty, right? Um, and uh, like a wicker basket. And we made that. We modeled that from a simple rectangle. We turned it into a profile. We drew another rectangle, put some beads on it. We turned those beads into a weave. We took another profile, put a little radius on the edge, and it made the cap to the weave. And bam, out of a block of wood. How you like me now? All right, looks like birch. Okay, it might be birch, Mike. Uh, it, it could very well be birch. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Howie. Howie, uh, he's in the... Uh, um, all right, David Clemens says, my mic's not working. Can y'all not hear me? Have I been just talking to air? Is my mic working? Guys, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me?
Dave Clemens says my mic not working. You guys let me know because. Um, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, let me see here. Somebody asked a question up here about the seam. Sort of looks like a crown. Uh, yeah, would, what in it? Does the crown get worn that way? Is it like that? You know, or is it this way? Yeah, you know, it's like those baskets that they carry around in, in, in you know, on their head, you know, when they're walking to the laundry and to the river and all that stuff. That's what it looks like. That's that's the basket. We made a weaving basket. Uh, looks like a little crochet basket, right? That your yarn and stuff would be in. I don't know. It looks like a little, it's gonna be a cool little cookie jar. So let's see here. Let's go back up. Somebody said something here. Um, Hey, Michael, if you're still around, uh, I caught you late. I didn't get to say hi to you. Uh, I learned a lot. Thanks for all you do. Um, John Burton uh, said, could you copy the first 10 lines of finished tool program and put at the end of the program so there is a smooth seam? <clears throat>
And no, I don't sit there and sniff lacquer thinner all day in my shop. I don't do that at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Let's see here. All right. So before. Nice. Ooh, that's messy. Hold on. I don't want it dripping all over my phone. Stop, stop, stop. Stop. After. Pretty. Pretty, pretty. That stuff dries quick, but yeah. So. Not bad. Little detail in the uh, grain come out. Right? Look at the bottom. Ooh, look at that pop. Yeah. So, stain it or clear coat it? That's the question of the day. I don't know. I'll uh, sit there and figure it out. All right. Now I get to uh, sit here and smell all the uh, lacquer thinner that I spilt on the floor. But um, it evaporates quickly. That's why I got the shop door open. Oh, man, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Safety first, guys. Safety first. <laughs> All right. So um, glad you guys uh, like that. So uh, definitely clear coat would look awesome, right? Sylvia says, cool, nice. Uh, the green is beautiful. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's already evaporated and everything. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, pretty cool. The camera really is not doing it a whole lot of justice. But uh, it's got it makes it look like now these are these cuts are smooth, but the way the grain is, I think this was like a burl or something, but the way the grain is coming down, it looks real jaggedy. Uh, and everything in there, you can you, that's the grain. I don't know if you guys can see that grain pattern. Uh, where's it at? It's coming, uh, what, what way is it going? It's going this way through here, uh, and it's kind of translating from that, you know, down the lid the acetone's kind of dried up now but um or the lacquer thinner but yeah pretty cool piece we'll see what i do with it we'll see if i hollow it out uh cut the lid off and all that stuff i'm going to sit there and examine it because i want to make sure that i can set up a jig uh for my uh bandsaw that holds this thing true and straight so that when it cuts it cuts along that lid because if I get any, you know, I don't want any drift or anything like that. So I want to be very careful with it. Um, you know, I may, uh, you know, uh, I may, you know, create a uh, jig that uh, that wraps around the throat, you know, just a plate. Uh, I'll maybe make a little box that wraps around here that gives me a flat surface. And I may take a flush cut saw across that flat surface by hand and take it easy. I don't know. You know, the bandsaw is going to be quicker and easier. Uh, and uh, it runs pretty true. It's a Laguna. It should do good. Um, all right. <laughs> Come here, says it smells like bubble gum. Lacquer thinner does. Uh, let's see. Here. It's a, it's, it's, it's not the best taste of bubble gum. You wouldn't want to kiss somebody that's chewing that gum. Uh, do a glaze, right? I could do, I could always do, um, I could do a Danish oil, a natural Danish oil, right, to bring out the natural beauty of the grain. A uh, nice little wipe-on finish. Uh, oil finish or what have you. Uh, I could do all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. We'll we'll get her figured out and see what we come up with. And I'll let you guys know and try to show you the end results uh, and stuff. Um, I just got to figure out what I want to do with as far as hollowing it out and stuff. Because I want to see how I want to approach the hollowing uh, and everything. All right, everybody. Uh, stay safe. Uh, let's see here. So say safe for sure. You shouldn't be able to smell it with a proper mask. That's right. I have an RZ mask. Uh, and, uh, yeah, um, we're good. Let's see here. Stay safe. Uh, we got that. Do it on the CNC, uh, with an end mill, uh, to cut halfway through. Ah, uh, yeah. But here's the thing real quick. I'm going to just answer that question. Uh, it says, uh, do it on the CNC with an end mill to, uh, cut halfway through. Uh, I'm assuming when you're talking about cutting the lid off, well, 
an end mill is too much diameter, right? I don't want to, I don't want to lose all that. Uh, I don't have very much meat here. Uh, and I want to cut it right on this ridge line. So I don't want to lose that, uh, that much meat. I want that nice little lid sticking up like that, uh, when it sits down on there. So an end mill, uh, I mean, it'd have to be a very small end mill, you know, and I'd only be able to get a half inch cut. Um, I could probably pop it back on the, uh, lathe or the fourth axis, uh, take us my 16th inch end mill, uh, come in right where I want it and have it spin around and cut a, a shallow groove. So it gives my, uh, my bandsaw something to follow, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, I'll figure out, uh, how I want to do that. All right, everybody. Uh, great class. Uh, I appreciate all of you, um, DIY my touch offs. Uh, let's see here. Uh, going to DIY my touch offs to learn something good every night. Good, actually, good. Yeah, man, DIY. It's your it's your machine, man. S prop, you know, tune it up. Uh, mineral spirits is probably uh, is would probably good as well. Yeah, mineral spirits exactly would have done good as well. I just don't have any in the shop. I got lacquer thinner and paint thinner. All right, everybody. Until next time. I'll see you soon. Bring it to your shop for the final. We could, we could, we could see about that. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks for the offer, Crystal. We'll, we'll see about that. See if I can get on down there. Uh, boiled linseed oil, yeah, or uh, beeswax and uh, mineral oil. You know, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, nice rub-on finish. See you guys. Yay for that. Ha, <laughs> ha,